Welcome back to World War II TV, folks. And we are kind of halfway through Naval Battles Week now. And what I love about my channel, if you've been following me since the beginning or if you are a recent convert to the channel, is I like bringing different voices and different experiences to look at World War II TV. I like my military historians who come on and talk about ship types and classifications and battalions and companies and the tech stuff. But I also like people looking at it from more of a social history point of view and people, people at war and what they did. And today's show is very much that type. It's about people at war rather than let's classify different types of frigate by the ones that are built in 41, those built in 42. It's just a different way of talking about it. So uh, my guest today, Julia Jones, is in the yachting, navy, maritime, history world, writer, you name it. She's done it and she has written a new book about called Uncommon Courage, about some of the yachtsmen volunteers who served in World War II. So without further ado, I will bring Julia in. So good evening, Julia. How are you today? <laughs> Hello, Paul. Well, it's quite exciting to be here, actually. Well, it's uh, I say I love having a different variety of guests on. So you, you're, you've done all sorts of things with regards to sailing in principle. But as I understand, this is your first kind of look at the sailing aspect with regards to a, a, you know, the Second World War. And so my first question is going to be kind of what made you want to look at this subject? Um, pure, pure chance, I suppose. No, actually, um, do you know, I worked this out the other, uh, the other day and you're the first. Uh, we'll see how it works with you. I worked out that I was conceived just after the 1953 split head review. So there we are. It was in the cradle. <laughs> I, my, my parents um, went down there to watch. And, you know, that was really one of the last big moments when the fleet came together. And even at that time, people were saying, oh, dear, they're not looking, you know, quite as we remembered them. And I just I just did the maths and I worked it out. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's nice. They got home. They, they um... anyway, there we are. Um, so. I didn't know in my cradle um, that I would be doing this, you know, 60 something mm. years later. Um, and I was actually up in this attic one day looking for a logbook because I have a lovely um, yacht called Peter Duck. And, she, you know, she's done various things. And, and I was looking for a logbook and I didn't find it. And you know how it is. If you're looking for one thing, you find something else. Yep. And what I found. Um, can I can I share my slide? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because what I found was that um, the little um, the HM uh, stationary blue folder um, in the top, and it's called the Cruise of Naromis, 1939, and that's my dad um, before I knew him. So it's a prequel, if you like, um, and he was 21 in 1939, and he joined this thing called the RNVSR, which I'd never heard of, and they took him off to the Baltic in August, um, sort of taking photos of things, and I was you know, very amazed by this. And I realised that actually when we were kids, he tried to tell me and my brother about um, that. And we just thought that his war service was boring um, because, you know, he didn't sort of um, jump out of aeroplanes or, or um, tunnel under fences or do anything like that. Um, but I read this little this little cruise of Naromis, August 1939, and and I read his diary and then I found a little cache of papers, you know, just quite a lot of them were sort of flimsies saying secret on the top. And mm. I was quite surprised and intrigued by all of this. So one thing led to the other. I did publish The Cruise of Naromis as a book, thinking that it was just be for my grandchildren, because none of them, well, my grandchildren and um, my children, because none of them had known dad and so I thought that they ought to and then people looked at it and said no this is interesting just as you were saying at the beginning Paul it's a sort of um it was a different a different point of view of a, a, a young man um you know very um inexperienced not really knowing who he was um so when he came back from his cruise he found that um his call-up papers had already been sitting um on the doormat for a week and he was sent straight off to that dirty great depot ship um there called hms fourth with the second submarine flotilla and again i thought what an extraordinary i, I had a 21 year old at the time and i looked at my son and i imagined my father and i thought you know how extraordinary it is um that these you know what seemed to me very young men went off to do these things um and at the same time i well, no. 
so that that was that um but i couldn't quite get it out of my system this rnv sr what was it who were they what did they do and um, at the same time i was aware that i had um my, an uncle my godfather my father's older brother um who had various quite angry um views about about the war and that's uncle jack you can see him in the picture there um and he was in the dieppe raid which was pretty horrible and he didn't hesitate to tell anybody you know just how horrible it was and he he wasn't complimentary about um lord mountbatten or general montgomery or anybody so i had these two people um and so i suppose that started me off I suppose it was lying there already to be mm. interested, but finding that little book um, and discovering a little bit more about the RNVSR um, set me off. And, and then I couldn't stop. And anyway, it was locked down. Um, so I carried on researching people. Um, well, what, what you're saying is interesting because I was chatting to, to Nick Hewitt yesterday before we went live. In fact, we were just having the chat like you and I just did. And we were talking about the fact that with naval history, mm. a lot of people just study the ships it's it becomes almost like playing battleships in the bathtub you're talking about <laughs> this this carrier has this classification they're going against this one here and it's in all that study of ships and maneuvers they kind of lose sight that it is people it's people crewing these 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 ships it is little almost like a you know the bigger ships it's like a whole town it's a it's a village of people from the from the top down to the bottom that make this village on on steel function and i think it, that that aspect of the naval history, the reminding ourselves that it is people, is interesting. And so, talking, with your, I guess we'll get back to your presentation when you'll talk about who these people are. But it seems to me that the assumption is, is that in 1939, is the British, the powers that be, thought that if you had had anything to do with boats, be it a rowing boat, being a yacht, being anything at all, you would therefore be suited to life in service in the senior service. Is that kind of how it worked back then? It worked a bit differently for um, my yachtsman um, mm. because what you're saying is quite right because the admiralty um, and is is naturally gravitates to having bigger and better warships um, and in the mid 1930s so you know we're talking about sort of 1935 1936 when there was the Abyssinian crisis. Um, they realised that they were suddenly they'd found themselves in a new arms race with Germany, um, and they, re you know, they they instantly started to you know upgrade, um, improve the armour, um, build more warships. There were various things they forgot to build at the time, but they did have enough um, a sort of. The still small voice said to them, OK, we can build these ships, but actually, who's going to be the officers? Because mm. in the generation between the wars, um, they had sacked, you know, pretty well everybody. Um, if you look at the, the, the guy um, sort of third from the whichever side it is, um, Edward Coverley Kennedy, um, he was Ludovic Kennedy's father. Mm -hmm. um, and he was one of that generation of officers, First World War officers um who got the Geddes axe and i mean there was more to his story than that but there was a there was a lot of pe pe people who'd been retired um the regular rnvr um their numbers were capped because what the navy didn't want to do was spend any money on people they only wanted to spend it on ships because you know they, they had actually persuaded parliament to vote through a large amount of money um but it needed to go on ships because, you know, maybe they weren't going to need the people. Um, and I think that generation between the wars was an interesting one because so many of them, like Neville Shute's one of the people um, who comes in my category as a, he, he, he comes as an elderly yachtsman. I mean, he was all of 40, you know, so obviously he was an elderly yachtsman. But his slightly older brother, Fred, had been killed um, in, <clears throat> in France. Um, and a lot of the Neville just about he just about was there at the very end of the First World War and he was sure he was just going to die and he was amazed when he found that he wasn't dead and one of the things there was a sort of a flowering of sailing in in the years between um the wars it it, 
instead of being a sort of rather grand thing to do, you know, you, you the czar or the Kaiser or somebody, lots more sort of normal people, you know, like this little chap. Um, he's actually he's he's sailing round Lincolnshire in in a, in a ten foot dinghy. I mean, what a crazy thing to do. Um, and then people were looking for ways to prove themselves. Quite a lot of them. Um, you'll see this book at the end here. And here's somebody else who comes in later. Um, the rich ones um, went off to be Greenland explorers or look at Antarctica or something like that because they knew that the, the generation before them had suffered massively. They wondered if they were ever going to measure up to them. And of course, a lot of them didn't even have fathers to measure up to. Mm. Or there were fathers who were so remote, um, like Ludwig Kennedy's father or Nicholas Montserrat's father, that they couldn't really talk to them anyway. So when the Admiralty in 1936 sort of thought to itself, oh, whoops, what are we going to do about um, officers? Um, so they obviously reckoned they could press gang men, just as as you were saying, you know, they could sort of scoop them up when the time was needed. Um, actually, to, to manage even a not a very huge ship, you do need to understand, you know, a bit about navigation and how the sea works and, you know, that sort of stuff. You don't need to necessarily know about the ship, but you need to know about winds and tides and coasts and things. So they said that um, any gentleman interested in yachting could um, sign up on this list, which was the RNVSR, um, and just say, yep, yeah, you know, if I'm needed, I'm ready. And they didn't, they didn't give them any training. They didn't, um, you know, give them any uniform. They didn't have to pay them or anything like that. Um, they just sort of let them let them get on with it. They encouraged some of them to study um, for a Board of Trade certificate. Because these people were yachtsmen, they, they were quite used to using their own initiative. So they tended mm. to sort of gang up together and, and you know, go off and practice. Um, the, some of the yacht clubs, the Little Ship Club in, in particular, you know, hired in lecturers to come and talk to these people. But essentially, they they were left to use their initiative and luckily that's sort of what they were good at um but when it got to september the 3rd 1939 they were a little bit um uncertain what they were going to do um with these yachtsmen they, they, how many are we talking sorry to interrupt how many are we talk how many do we think signed up for this about 2000 wow so yeah. it's, I mean, I mean, because I was thinking there, and I, I apologize for jumping in already, but no, we, no, do. this is very similar to the because you're talking about that kind of adventurous spirit of people, yeah. uh, the hobby becoming accessible. So yachting went from being an upper class pursuit to a kind of more middle class, maybe even lower class. This is the same story we hear with the aero clubs, you know, with, with the people who often became fighter races later on because they had been yeah. flyers, except. We know that story because because we all love Spitfires and Hurricanes. That story of the kind of gentleman flyer, I mean, people like Roger um, Bushell, who escaped from the Stadium of Three, those kind of people, those that's been told. But it seems oh, this story the heroes, of the, the heroes is, of my, is brand new. It's the same yeah. thing, but it's not been told, yeah. told about. Yeah, no, I, th I think I think that 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 is true. Um, maybe um, maybe there's a sort of. I don't know, a sort of inverted snobbery. Maybe we think of yachts as being posh. And certainly quite a lot of the people were posh. But people like my father wasn't posh at all. I mean, you know, he, he would be he would be like the guy um in he'd be sailing that sort of thing, you know, not not, you know, some trim he wasn't in the you know 1939 fast net race. Um so it was a much wider group um than, than you would reckon. And one of the things I do quite admire about um, the Admiralty is, is, is they're completely unscrupulous about, in wartime, um, what they requisitioned. I'm sure the War Office and everybody was as well. So when they were thinking, what are we going to do um, with these yachtsmen? People like my father, who had been only been taken in because he wasn't really a gentleman, um, but he was, he was good with figures and they'd messed up so badly at Munich um, that that's why his um, call up papers were sitting on the mat because they could see from about august the 24th they could see that that you know the thing was inevitable and that's when um his his telegram had been sent but he was still out in the baltic with little naromis um at that point um but he he got um a commission very quickly and so once you were commissioned you stopped being rnvsr and you became rnvr and there were all sorts of sort of you know very english um 
pecking orders. Um, I think the Navy is quite um, quite prone to pecking orders. Um, so sometimes the regular RNVR rather looked down on the amateurs and the regular Navy, you know, thought, what are these amateurs doing? And then, of course, there, there were the RNR, who were the merchant seamen and the fishing captain. So there was a lot of sort of, you know, stuff um, going on. But, you know, they got over it. But one of the thing, places they requisitioned was the sort of the, the, the newly built municipal swimming baths in Hove, which is this place um, in the corner here. And they said, that is HMS King Alfred. And that's where you'll go and do your training and you'll learn about King's regulations and <laughs> Admiralty instructions. Um, but what they found very quickly was that some of them just had to, you know, like like my dad and some of the ones who'd already studied and got their um Board of Trade certificate. They just sent them straight off. Um, if, if they, and down at the bottom here, um, here's Derek Rayner, who is a marvellous bloke, um, and he's regular, regular RNVR, so he tends to be a bit sniffy about the supplementaries. But anyway, we'll forgive him because he was a great bloke. Um, and he gets sent up to Lowestoft to take over this sort of pleasure garden and turn that into HMS Europa, <laughs> which, which, and he has to sort of, they're having a, a Piro show in, in, in the, the they're practicing for the evening's entertainment. He says, "Sorry, girls, you know, no show tonight. This is now, um, you know, a a, um, a Royal Navy stone frigate." So it's it's sort of um, those early chaotic days um, do have their, you know, their sort of um, slightly humorous um, make do. I, I like I like the make do approach. I like yeah, the, it, the, it came up in yesterday's show that 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 thirty eight, thirty nine, forty period is very much kind of. Trial and error, um, making do, um, cobbling things together until it kind of works, and then you get to the, the end of the war era where everything is working as theoretically as a, a streamlined machine. But it took some time to get there. Absolutely, and and I think I I, I learned a lot um, about that because I, it's very easy to um, just see a great mass of people and. I think one should see their individuality and, and what happened to them as individuals, because that's exactly what you were saying at the beginning, because mm. a crew is an entity, but <clears throat> that crew is also made up of individuals. And how did they feel about what was happening to them, particularly the ones, you know, who just joined up, you know, on, on day one. Um, so, yeah. Um, but what I, did come to realize when I started to sort of organize the great pile of stuff on my desk, and I'm never very um, organized, was that the war did go through um, very definite phases. And I'm sure you as a historian, you know, that that's perfectly obvious um, to you. Um, but to me, seeing it through the eyes of my my <laughs> yachtsman, um, it, it 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 felt different because of course they didn't know which phase they were in at the time, yeah. um, and the admiralty had forgotten some fairly basic things um, at the beginning, and and one of them was the need for small ships, but one of the things they hadn't forgotten was how successful they'd been in the Great War um, with blockading Germany, so they thought right we're going to do that. Again, we're going to send um, our, our big um, anti-submarine warfare trawlers um, up to the, the gap, the Greenland Gap. We're, we're going to get old um, merchant cruisers. We're going to stick a gun or two on them and we're going to get them up there. And we're going to try and stop war materials getting through to Germany. And for various reasons, it was much more difficult this time. But anyway, that was about the first thing that they did. And sadly... Um, for the RNVSR, that was where their first casualties came. Um, one of the one of the um, sources that I've enjoyed using is Yachting Monthly because I write for Yachting Monthly, um, and Yachting Monthly very soon started to have a special section for the RNVR because you know that's what you know that's what its readers did. Um, I mean, the, the, most of the magazine just, you know, did business as usual because the idea was that that kept people's morale up and that reminded them, you know, that there was a norma normality that they were waiting for them for. when they finished the job. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very yeah. important. Very important. But in the first sort of role of honour, as it were, um, the first um, name there um, is 
what you would normally what you might think of as a typical RNVR SR member. Um, he was a member of the Little Ship Club. He'd gone to the um, the lectures in the evening. He'd taken his board of trade course. So he'd been very quickly sent off on one of these big, big trawlers um, that had been converted for anti-submarine warfare. And he was the first one to die. And here's the memorial um, in Lowestoft at what <laughs> frightfully grand memorial for you, you, you'll remember the little sort of pleasure park that um, I that was it was mm -hmm. called Sparrow's Nest. Um, then it became HMS Europa, and and here's it was the headquarters of the Royal Naval Patrol Service. Yeah. Um, and anyway, his name is the first um, name on on that um, memorial. And um, one of the, the 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 Navy has sometimes quite a clever way of turning absolute disasters into. I think Mr. Churchill, because he was first Lord of the Admiralty, I think he was very good at this. And um, that rather horrible picture, which you probably can't see very well, is HMS Royal Pindy, um, which was commanded by, there he is, him. Oopsie, sorry, I'm not so clever. <laughs> I was trying to be clever with this. Um, Ludovic Kennedy's father, um, Edward Kennedy. And because he was a you know, a First World War, you know, proper pucker Royal Navy officer. Um, he he was running his. It, it was an ex PNO liner, you know, with a few guns added. Um, and so when the German battleships in the Scharnhorst and these now um, challenged him, you know, it was um, you know engage the enemy more closely. It was um, all guns blazing, you know, no thought of surrender. Um, you know, and I, and I think she was in that state within about a quarter of an hour. But yet, um, when you read the, the newspaper articles and you watch the Pathé News reels for November, you know, it was a great thing. This was the great traditions of the Royal Navy. And if you look at it now, you think, oh, hang on, that's really a great tradition of the Royal Navy. <laughs> I, think I think I'd rather stay at home, thank you very much. Well, we were good at spinning things to make them sound much better than they were in that era there. I mean, that, that's, yeah. the, that, that's and that's, the, as you said, to Churchill's credit and that of the British yeah, people and the, the Commonwealth that we did buy into this idea that, that it wasn't all lost and we weren't all on the brink of disaster because... We, we, you know, if you ask most British people who are around, we had they had, they had no belief they were on the brink of losing. They they believed all this, you know, this this daring do and pluck and and it was good. I'm glad we did. I'm glad they did. I think I think the approach to um, information sharing and propaganda was much more intelligent in the Second War than in the First War. You know, you didn't have that sort of North Cliff sort of, you know, atrocity stuff and maybe we should have had more atrocity stuff who knows um but i'm noticing and, and we'll get to it a little bit later on that some of the yachtsmen um and i'm thinking of nicholas monstrat particularly were encouraged to publish even in 1942 you know about what it was like on a corvette in 1942 you didn't have to wait until afterwards i mean you know you've got a different story afterwards but i think that that was a much more intelligent thing and i think I mean, looking at Yachting Monthly, sometimes the editor grumbles about, um, you know, the censors a bit random. Um, but, but you know, th they're, they're putting it in there. And you can see how difficult it is when your role of honour, you know, your deaths and your ship losses mount up. And they were only focusing on the RNVR. You know, if, if you weren't in that, I'm afraid you didn't, uh, unless you were, you know, a, a sort of known yacht club member mm. um so they very soon then added another column for sort of you know births and engagements and 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 marriages you know anything to try and and i think i think that was i thought that was intelligent actually you know the, the so you put the deaths and the losses and the woundings and the prisoners of war first but then you remind people that you know people are still falling in love and having babies and uh, you know i i like that um, but there's no denying it was pretty darn grim um, at the beginning. So uh, as well as sending people off patrolling and blockading um, to start with, um, and, and that was that was a useful way of using your yachtsman. Mm. Another useful way of using your yachtsman was send them minesweeping because that was something that had to get done. And, you know, if you were talking about um, the coastal convoys yesterday, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, there was that huge, great sort of barricade of mines and you had to keep the um, you had to keep the exits and entrances 
free if 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 it was going to be possible to go up from you know Scotland or you know down from Scotland to um the Thames estuary um Thames estuary is my sort of my sort of area um but very quickly and we're talking sort of October November particularly bad November um the mine sweeping didn't seem to be working um somehow and so here we've got HMS Gypsy um, who's come down to Harwich from Rosyth to join the sort of, you know, the Harwich destroyer force. And literally, um, you know, just a few days after she's down, there she is, sunk in Harwich Harbour, just just um, going out. And, and suddenly there was a sort of terrible spate of unexplained sinkings, um, particularly out around... Well, in in Nor command, really, but off the Norfolk coast, Suffolk coast, um, Kent entrance to the Thames, um, and, and and the Essex coast, obviously, um, and and there was panic. I mean, when HMS Gypsy went down um, in Harwich Harbour, I mean, you know, Churchill just was was roaring down, and the port captain got sacked, and um, you know, there, there was a real sense of crisis. And here again, I think the Navy um, was starting to show a lot of shrewdness because it looked at these volunteers and it looked and said, well, hang on, you know, what did you do before then? And so there's this chap here, um, he's called Fredman Ash Lincoln, and he'd been a prominent Jewish activist um, beforehand. He, he's um, a barrister. He's about to take silk, but he hasn't quite got there. Um, he's been very prominent in um, anti-Nazi protest. He knows his name is on in Hitler's black book. But he's so sweet. He, he, he said, the one thing I really wanted was to serve with the Royal Navy. And he goes off to night school and, you know, he, he, he studies his, his navigation because um, he's only a weekend sailor. Um, and, and that was all he wanted to do. But blow me down. Um, the... Navy take a look and say, hang on, no, 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 I think you'll find that you've got a very good brain here. And so he never really gets to see because they sit him down, they, they, they send him off to HMS Vernon and they say, now look, here are all these reports of all these sinkings that have happened, you know, over the last few weeks. Let's get your, um, your um, razor sharp intellect onto this, you know, what are the um, common factors? Um, and this chap here, um, is is Charles Goodeve and and he's a scientist. He's come over from Canada from Canada and he's joined the RNVR. Um, and they 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 realise that he too has got a really um, you know forensic engineering brain on him. And he was you know he was an absolute star. I mean you, you'll know everybody will know about him because he worked out the that these were magnetic mines and so what you could do was reverse the polarity. Yeah. Um, so. Clever minds were being brought in. And, you know, if one think, if we get to the end of the programme, we think, oh, did, did these yachtsmen volunteers make a difference? I think some of them, because when, when the Admiralty did have the good sense to use their um, professional expertise, I think we could argue that they had brought in something that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, well, this is the thing, isn't it? When, when, when some of the powers that be in the early part of the war, they kind of think that conscription is is maybe going to and, and and opening the, the military up to everybody is weakening it but you've only got to look at the assets that were brought in because you're bringing mm. in people from a wide variety of like i mean a bletchley park wouldn't have happened if we hadn't brought in the, the amateurs so the, mm. essentially the military had tried and couldn't do it so they brought in the amateurs but they brought in these great minds and that's where i think something like you're writing about these yachtsmen is they've got experience and it's it's a slightly different experience to what the regular navy would have so it just helps you to it's ideas isn't it the only way the allies were going to defeat the germans is out thinking them and all this hmm. Hmm. pool yeah. of resources and intelligence is how ultimately we did it is bringing these people in from different backgrounds who, who come together to to, to to achieve that so it's important that we're, we're covering that so um yeah well, I'm, I'm loving it and so are the viewers so uh we'll, we'll keep on going <laughs> Well, I think here was a here was a moment um, that that absolutely exemplifies what you're saying. Um, but it was it was a you know it, Norway um, in in 1940 was something that went very badly wrong. And at this point, I don't think um, the navy were necessarily aware of the talents or 
weren't they were very random i mean so the the rnvsr volunteers who'd gone off before the war surveying the coast of norway um and been you know, people like my dad um you know going off taking photographs in in the baltic there's very little evidence that this was ever used now here here's a really interesting chap he's he's um patrick dalzell job and his father was killed at the somme and he and his mother um had a sort of you know a, a sort of gentry gentrified um upbringing with very little money and they worked out that they could they could actually live um, more cheaply if they lived on a yacht um so they did and as he grew um more aware um a very young man um he came back in 1937 and said look I i'm going around the northern coast of northern norway you know i feel if there's ever ever any trouble it's going to be up there or it's going to be down the inner leads um of norway that you're going to need to know what's what and so he, he went as far as petsamo he went as far as um finland um just just you know i, I i'm sorry i haven't put up he, he had a really weird looking yacht which, which he sort of semi-built himself because he and his mother were really you know strapped um for cash um but yet, when he came back, the the um, Admiralty just weren't interested at all. Um, when he came back, in they, they, so they sent him off, um, you know, doing patrol duties um, off the Scottish coast on a drifter. But he was a very determined character. He's actually one of my absolute heroes. I, I do do have some tremendous heroes. Um, He's come up on a few World War Two TV shows. He's come up on the show about uh, Thirty Assault Unit. He's come up yep. in, the, in the Diet Plan a couple of times. So he's. It's, this is not his um, debut before uh, appearance on no, the channel. He's um, he's quite a legend. Yeah, he wrote, he wrote an extraordinarily good memoir um, called "From Arctic Snow to Dust of Norway," which, if people haven't read, I really do recommend that. I have, and it's brilliant. Yeah, it is brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You might not have heard of. So here's here's another one of the same. So anyway, so just just finishing with um, Patrick. Well, I mean, you've read the book, so you know. He kept on making a fuss. He kept on saying, look, I do know about Norway. I would like to go to Norway. And they put him on HMS Southampton, which is there. Um, and he, he sort of said, you do realise that, you know, it will be snowing when we get there. And they said, no. And and the August Courthold says, you know, the ignorance of um, certain areas of the Admiralty was simply massive, you know, about topography. So they hadn't, for instance, you know, got camouflage, you know, white camouflage. Um, and this chap, Quentin Riley, he was one of that generation of of the, the the richer young men who sort of, you know, it's a bit like going on your your gap year, but it's not. It's more serious than that. He'd been on the Greenland expedition, and he took his own little boat, which he used to sort of tow um, the expedition's um, float plane um, through, you know, from from place to place. Um, but he 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 actually bunked off from from the rnvr he got in a frightful trouble when he um got back um and 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 got himself to norway because he said honestly you 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 lot have got no idea you need this is how you do winter warfare um but it was a bit late by then but what was interesting one of the many things that was interesting about norway was the beginning of irregular companies the beginning of mm using people in a sort of guerrilla warfare sort of way and i and i i i like i'm mean, quentin riley i'm sure i wouldn't have liked him if i if i'd met him um he, he was a real sort of you know um sort of high anglican anti-women bigot but never mind um he did know about about um winter warfare and eventually he became a member of the general synod after the war and this was his best friend um Andrew Croft, um, who was also on those expeditions. And, you know, he married his sister because that's what, you know, chaps like that um, sort of did. And he became superintendent after the war of, of the police college at H Hendon. But in Norway, they were sort of charging about um, on these little these little Norwegian fishing boats, which they called puffers, you know, sort of well, it, setting light to places and exploding things and, and you know, basically um, acting like commandos before commandos had officially been, you know, as it were, invented. Um, so at that point, there was a big gap between the amateur view of, of what was what and the um, official view 
of, of what was what. And, I think and do you think that connects to what you said earlier, Julie, about the, the these yachtsmen being independently minded? Because, you know, mm. I'm, I'm not a sailor, but, you know, one of my best friends here in Normandy is down in Granville. He has a yacht down there. You know, and it, you have to be multi-skilled. You've got to any one thing you're not good at, you'll come short very quickly. You've got to be practical, <laughs> you've got to navigate, you've got to be be balanced. Or you know, there's a whole raft of skills that come into it, and it and it creates. I'm assuming this sense of uh, belief in yourself and 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 mm. wide ranging skills. And if we need something to help us through the war, it's those two factors: belief in yourself and wide ranging skills. Well, I mean, you know, if, I mean, you've, you've read um, Dalzell Jobs book i mean he was he was so stroppy the, the 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 navy said right you can't keep evacuating civilians from narvik you know we need your boats back and he said no sorry you're not having them and i'm going to carry on um evacuating civilians which he did and he really thought he was going to be chucked out um and he probably deserved to be chucked out but instead i mean this is so silly um but but when he got back um you know king harkon gave him a medal um but the navy sent him off down to the south atlantic um on on a um an armed merchant cruiser and he has sufficient humility to say he did actually learn a lot um then you know about about um big ships and towing the line and that sort of thing and again um uh, quentin riley um had to sort of wheedle his way back into the rnvr because he'd you know taken time off um without without leave but luckily, those the sort of the network of friendships, the sort of pre-war explorer friendships, want a really strong network. So when they were trying to build up, um, you know, sort of commando units, in independent companies, um, that was where they went. And I mean, you're talking about 30 AU. Well, Quentin Riley, although he's not a charismatic figure at all um he was actually you know what one of the right hand men he, he he was he was in command um at the sicily landings and at salerno because he'd learnt in the antarctic um how important it was you know to plan and do logistics he was he was said to be a really good quartermaster and i think you know it's all very well to have you know wonderful dash um and 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 bravery and all that but you actually need somebody to remember you know to get petrol for your jeep or you know whatever whatever it might be anyway um i'm not going to talk long about about this because i think we all know what a completely dismal period um may june july um was all I'm going to say is that for the Yachtsman volunteers, they weren't involved in the sort of little ships Dunkirk thing because they were already um, they were already there. They were already in uniform, um, and very often um, they were, for instance, on a minesweeper. Um, and there's Robert Hitchens, who again you'll you'll know because incredibly famous later on in Coastal Forces, but because we haven't really got coastal forces at this point um he was one of many um who was who was serving on a minesweeper and his son wrote a very good biography um called gunboat command and there's one bit in it when hitchens he's he's trying to help get people off the beaches and into the ship's boats and out to um hms niger um, and he said, at this point, I realised that the years I've spent getting in and out of small boats has really given me a special skill. And, and that's that's true. And that's not necessarily a skill that's a Navy skill, because, you know, Navy, you're normally in a big ship, whereas sailing, you know, you're very often, you know, sort of getting in the dinghy and rowing ashore and yeah. coming out again. And all that's it is often quite tricky um, if, if you're getting on and off a beach and the surf. And then that, that was a major problem at Dunkirk. And again, that was one of the moments when the, the yachtsmen realised that, you know, that they, they had particular, you know, boat handling, small boat handling skills, which were useful. Um, but there's a whole, a, a, there's a whole tranche of stuff that went on, not just with um, Operation Dynamo, um, but with um, Operation Cycle and Operation Aerial, where, again, people had to take responsibility. And several of my 
my chaps were sort of picked out of doing really quite dull um, jobs and suddenly given a revolver and, you know, sent off down to Nantes or somewhere, somewhere like mm. that to um, get, get the... And just, just a quick question about the writing process, because, you know, you said at the beginning it was all because of your dad's story. But it seems mm. to me you must have been absolutely amazed to find out how many incredible heroes you were to find from this one source. Because I mean, it, already we're not we're not halfway through the slides. You've you've mentioned some absolute Sorry. legends in World War II history already. I mean, it, it, you yes. you must have been, you know, rubbing your hands with glee at the fact all these people had this connection with this the subject you wanted to write about. Yeah, I think I think you've got to look at a source like that though a little bit critically haven't you because mm. naturally you, you you gravitate to the memoirs of the people who've lived and the people who have become famous later on and you see it through there so it's actually very important um to try and look at some of the people who didn't survive very good point. and also my dad was really useful because he was sort of the um I can't think of the right word, but the opposite to, I mean, he he, he did know Robert Hitchens because later on, um, dad was, well, I mean, everybody knew Hitch, but I, I remember as, as a as a sort of child and a teenager, um, when it was dad's birthday, we always used to have to drink Mark 8's, which was the sort of legendary cocktail that, that um, Hitch um, developed for coastal forces. But dad didn't you know couldn't see very well um wasn't a confident Hitchens was quite a bit older than than quite a lot of the um people and he, he'd had the experience of of driving a racing car at Le Mans he'd he'd been in the fast net race you know he'd he'd sailed against um Peter Scott in um the the you know the dinghy sailing the Prince of Wales Cup you know he he he'd done stuff um so you have to remember that that other people um, who were yachtsmen of a different sort, like Dad, um, you know, were still there and still doing their useful jobs, but they were never going to get, you know, umpteen DSOs and bars and DFCs and, you know, all, 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 all that. So it's, it's, it's important not to let the big boys shout the loudest, but I do, I do think... Um, that if we get to a point where we think, did these people make a difference? I, I do think um, that it's arguable that people who had that sort of foresight from 1936, 1937, to put their names down on this list and then follow it up by action were actually, you know, rather special yeah. people. Um, no, so, it's, it's so, going back to what I was saying about the aero clubs. And also we've done shows with people like Damien Lewis, who writes about the commandos, is that those early forces, it wasn't necessarily what you knew. It was who you knew. It was all yep. sort of an old boys network. And there's the guy at the club who's done that. Oh, he's been to he's been to North Africa. He can tell you about that place over there. And this idea of of, of recruiting from people you knew you knew. And I, mm -hmm. I was very aware of the kind of commando, SAS, LRDG kind of area. And I was a bit li less well known, but I knew a bit about the Aero Club. But this naval aspect is all new to me. And I'm just, I'm loving the fact there's this whole other school of, of, of a body of people that, that came together and, and kind of knew each other. That It's extraordinary. I'm loving it. And people are loving you. They're, 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 the comments in the sidebar are all very, very complimentary. So uh, I'll hand oh, it back to you and keep on telling your stories. We that, love it. That's putting me under pressure, Paul. <laughs> no, no, no. We're loving it. Everyone's in. Everyone's in a good mood today. So uh, we're just we're oh, just good. absorbed. We're like sponges well, for your stories. It's Wednesday, isn't it? Yeah, we can all we can yeah. all be happy. We're getting into the second half of the week. Um, yes, but but again, also apart from the ones who um, then you know were like Peter Scott, if you like, um, or Nicholas Montserrat, you know who who. Um, became famous partly because of the war but partly because of the person that they were anyway i think some people and and that's why you know we're not lingering over something like operation aerial um but for some people who were just sort of picked up and and, and said okay right you can go and help organize the evacuation from bordeaux or something like that you know that's really that's really quite something that's that's a hell of an affirmation isn't it so that would develop you as a person even if you weren't you know, like that already. Um, yeah. But I think what um, the, well, I mean, everybody knows this, that the events of 
that period, it changed people. Um, it, it, it made people realize that this was a real war and it was really dangerous and it was no good, um, you know, faffing about, we we're gonna have to do something. So in fact, Nicholas Montserrat, who, you know, we'll get to later, hadn't, he wasn't, so I cheated, I suppose. Um, he's a yachtsman, but he wasn't part of the RNVSR because before the war, um, he was part of that um, that generation who was in rebellion against um, the Great War. And so he was a pacifist, he was a socialist. Um, when his mother dressed him up in sailor suits and said, you know, <laughs> you've got, you've got salt water in your veins, you're an Englishman. He said, no, I bloody haven't. <laughs> um, but uh, it, come April 1940, um, there was a specific call going out for yachtsmen. And there was an advertisement in the Times, for instance, again, saying gentlemen interested in yachting. And Montserrat's father, who'd been in the first war, cut it out, um, sent it to him and, and Montserrat joined up. And he suddenly realised that he was he was signing up for all the sort of public school values that he tried his best um, to resent and, and to, to reject, but yet. Um, so there's another sort of tranche. And also, um, here's Neville Shute. Um, and suddenly in um, April 1940, the age restrictions were changed. And so elderly yachtsmen, um, and, and again, <laughs> that meant you were, you know, you might be over 40. <laughs> um, so shoot joined up but this is where again the the, the admiralty um they're getting their recruiting head together and they're looking at people um so um neville norway as he was when he was in the navy um had gone to all the trouble of persuading his wife who was a doctor to take their daughters and go to canada because then he said you know then i can really get to sea and you know i can i can you know I can fight without worrying about you at home. Um, but of course, you know, as, as an aero specialist, you'll know that, that, that um, in the 1930s, he'd been immensely involved with, um, you know, the development of airships and things. Um, and although at this point he'd, he'd been chucked out of his company, I think he was probably not an easy person to work with. Um, once the um, Admiralty looked at his papers, you know, he thought he was going to be put in charge of some nice little, you know, mine sweeping trawler or something like that. They said, oh, no, 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 no. I think you'll find um, it's an office for you. And he was furious. He was really, really angry. But, you know, once you've signed on the dotted line, you sort of have to go where you're sent. And the same with this chap. Tremendous, um, tremendously clever man. Um, you and Montague. Um, and he went to King Alfred's and um, he, he, he writes beautifully in his memoir about the first day as you know they, they have this you know they have parades and you sing hymns and stuff um, and they say fall out the Roman Catholics and so you know um, and then he waited for them to say fall out the Jews um, and they never did so he found that, that actually he was meant to if he would wanted to not be part of um, the hymn singing and the praying he was meant to go out with the Roman Catholics um, but he actually was deeply moved by being part of all that and sing you know saying the navy prayers and singing the navy hymns and he was really quite pleased when he was sent off to um a, a requisitioned yacht to go and do per, patrol service but again once the admiralty collected its wits and they said, hang on hang on this chap's a king's council <laughs> i think excuse me you're coming ashore and and poor montague he he he, he refused um because you could then be part of the special rnvr um and then you had a sort of different career paths and, and you know you would get promotion more quickly but you'd have to wear a green stripe in between your wavy um gold stripes and he absolutely refused he was not going to be a green striper um so he spent the rest of the war sort of you know in places he was first he was sent to the humber um to collect information from trawler men um but then he was sent to the citadel where um you know as everyone will know you know he 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 masterminded um things like um uh, you know, Operation Mincemeat, um, and he ran a tremendous sort of stable of of double agents. I mean, you know, it's amazing, and so, and but yet 
he, he was a he was a proper he was a proper yachtsman and and he would he'd been part of the 1939 fast net race in this lovely lovely boat here Latifia and and they'd had a tremendous sort of in in yacht races you know you, you're all competing against each other but sometimes individual yachts have an individual sort of ding dong and I find it very um I don't know um not symbolic, but something um, that Latifia um, was was known for having a tremendous battle all the way through the fast net with the Kriegsmarine, who brought over that enormous great yacht called Nord Wind, um, and and I just like to feel that that, that it was a sort of um, you know a sort of pre run, if you like. Um, but one somebody who I haven't put up but I've put um he was a colleague of Neville Norway um and he was called Edward Terrell um and he too was a lawyer awful lot of lawyers um yeah and, and he didn't really think he was a very good sailor because he kept running aground um so when the elderly yachtsman offer so he you know gone to do air aid precautions but when the elderly yachtsman offer came up he was another one um who who put himself forward and he said well look you know I'm not actually a very good yachtsman but you know I do know about about admin I'll, I'll come and do um you know human resources for you or something like that and they 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 talked to him and and they said oh, I hear you're a bit of a spare time invent inventor and he said well you know I've made the odd exploding fountain pen <laughs> in my time and he he was sent off to the um Charles Goodeves um department of miscellaneous weapons development along with Norway and, and they, they became quite close and Carol um, found himself um, inventing plastic armour um, which which um, protected merchant ships you know that's a tremendous thing to do yeah. absolutely tremendous yeah. he also invented some horrible great bombs as well um, but we'll 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 skip on from that oh here are horrible great bombs um, this is one of the oddest things um, when the great big um they, they they were those same magnetic mines that had been being dropped out to sea but when we got better at dealing with them they tended to stockpile um in germany so goering had the good idea um that he fixed parachutes to them and, and drop them you know on london or liverpool or wherever um because um they might as well blow things up there um but because they were um intended for use at sea um it it turned out to be the Navy's job to get rid of these things when even though they landed on land. Um, and I do I do think that, you know, in any warfare scenario, the people who go off to to defuse um, unexploded bombs are sort of just amazing. And there's this chap here. Um, John Miller, um, and and he he's an education officer from Northamptonshire, um, and he joined the RNV SR, um, and he's in training at King Alfred's. And they say, you know, can we have volunteers for special services? And so they will step forward. Um, he says, but I'm the you know I'm I'm the group captain. I should go, and and so he finds that he's he's um, you know sent up for training and they literally they have about about sort of a week's training you know whereas you know a proper engineer would have a proper you know lifetime of engineering training um and then that that he's sent off down to Essex so here he's um in Barking Creek um with with a wonderful um able seaman you you, you have to you know you pick your seaman um and then um you, you off off you go and and this chap um elderly um sort of Dorset counter councillor type um had to be sort of lowered into these um gasometers in Liverpool because one of these parachute bombs had fallen there so you know and he, he was he was over 40 um so there was no way he was going to get sent to sea and and he had to be sort of strapped in a diving suit with oxygen to to defused and wow. the, the 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 george the george crosses and george medals won by these people uh, earned by these people it was really quite quite startling and and you know i'm afraid there were you know uh, a lot of casualties um as well um even the editor of, of yachting monthly morris griffiths um was 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 um a a bombs specialist which is you know is again not what not you, what you expect to be doing here i think we're on um 
you know, much, much safer ground and, 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 and better known ground. And I know that you've discussed the Battle of the Atlantic many, many mm. times. So I'm actually going to sort of not be too long on this, except just to say, um, just to say Montserrat, really. Um, but to say, so to say more than Montserrat, because so Montserrat is an example of somebody who's come in a little bit later than the first volunteers. And he's always quite a complicated and quite a conflicted person. But as I was saying earlier, I, I, I think it's fascinating. He had this great desire to write because he thought he was going to get killed. And he thought, I've just got to say something before, before, you know, I'm killed. And so he, he, he was enabled to bring out um, HMS, uh, HM Corvette um, and a book about the East Coast convoys um, in 1942, 1943. But what's been really interesting in the research process was then comparing that with what he said later in the cruel sea mm. and what he said even later than that um in his memoir because he wasn't nearly so starry-eyed about his his um commanding officer and he's very very good on the sort of the um regular um amateur you know bad feelings and feuds and petty stuff he's he's really um uh, anyway so so then Derek, Dennis Rayner, who you saw earlier as a regular RNVR person, is a life not well known, deserves to be much better known, um, because he was so dedicated and he was the first um, volunteer officer, first amateur, the first um, RNVR person to co command a corvette on the Atlantic convoys and later on he was the first to command a destroyer and he was the sort of person who who wanted to be in the navy when he was a little boy but couldn't um and there's that amazing sort of mystique of the navy which one should never discount i think it, it really gets people's or you know a certain type of, well certain i think that this is where we're, i'm gonna jump in there's there's the navy we think of and then there's this I don't want to use the word amateur navy, but the thing is about World War II. We said this before we went live: is World War mm. II victory was achieved by amateurs. I mean, that's the the professional military had were there at the beginning, but it was draftees and conscripted and volunteers coming in from these walks of life. And mm. you, know, you take something as as vast as Operation Overlord or the invasion of Sicily. Yeah. You know, I don't know the percentages, but 70 or 80 percent of the people involved in that are, are there because they have to be, not because it's a career choice. It's not a. It's not a it's not their real job and i think that's the the navy we think of of the of the of the traditional navy is very much the regular navy that's the, yeah. the organization there's a thing that came on facebook today some there was a, a rating in the navy who who joined as a boy sailor in 1915 and was still there in 1955 or something and that's mm -hmm. what we think of as the navy someone it's a long time career he it's the service but this is the this is the amateur side of it. I don't I don't mean it in a negative way. I mean the the for the war duration side of it. Mm, yeah, That's yeah. So intriguing. And, 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 and I and I you know I know I know that you're 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 right. It was a sort of massive infusion of energy and ideas, um, yeah. particularly because of the experience of the 1920s and and the depression and having to sack everybody. Um, but yes, you know, a, a, a huge. Um, I think if let, let me see where I am. Yeah, um, I think coastal forces is is a really good example um, because a because the navy because they they are a bit obsessed by warships or they used to be they can't anymore really. Um, they had completely forgotten that at the end of the first world world war they had got coastal motorboats they got uh, torpedo boats they'd done they'd done the you know the the, the Zeebrugge raid the ostend raid you know they they'd got they knew that you could zoom across um the channel and and here's an advert in in yachting monthly um sort of between the wars of the sort of speedy speedy craft that people were developing but the admiralty just didn't listen and and when people like robert hitchens finally um finally they start to get some of these boats and he says in in we fought them in gunboats who he, he he looks at advertisements. He says, here they all were. And yet nobody bought them for us. Nobody remembered us. But once um, 
coastal forces really got going, there's an interesting moment, and this is what I mean about sort of learning things that I didn't know because you know, because I'm not a war historian, mm -hmm. um, about um, the progression of the war, um, yeah. was that when the theatre of war uh, got bigger, you know, for instance, the Mediterranean became a much more um, active theatre of war, they, they needed to move the regular RN officers off. And so there's suddenly, in about August 1941, there's, there's a really big change um, when lots of the RN types, you know, who were the first um, commanders of the motor torpedo boats and the motor gunboats, um, all get shipped off to go and do stuff elsewhere because, you know, that's needed. So that's when people like Hitchens gets promoted. And you can actually, well, he, he, you can't see, but one can be told and believe um, that a different sort of hierarchy, a different sort of decision making, um, a, a more sort of collaborative um, approach um, is taken. Because I mean, Hitchens thought, although he, you know, loved the Navy, he did think that some of his early training in gunboats was pretty silly. It was all about, you know, waving flags at each other, you know, out at sea. And he said, you know, essentially, you know, that's not what we're going to be doing. You know, we've just got to find ways of cooperating with each other in the dark, um, at high speed, um, in extremely volatile situations. Um, and this was an area where, obviously, Yachtsman, but of course, by this time, lots of people were joining the RNVR, you know, who weren't necessarily yachtsmen. It was, it was, you know, it was a way of volunteering. And you know, I, I know, you know, that 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 you're saying people had to. Well, they did sort. Some people had to because they were conscripted. Um, but uh, some of these people, people like my uncle Jack, who you saw at the beginning, yeah. was in a protected. Um, uh, occupation to start with but come the end of 1940 you know he had to because it was in his head that he had to not not and nobody was making him he, he, he could have stayed ashore he was an industrial designer um but he, he was also you know a, a a boat lover so he sort of had to because it was his duty and and you know his conscience and you know all of all of that so he was a sort of natural type to to become you know a small part um of coastal forces and once you start to give these um, very self-starting, um, very responsible, quite aggressive, um, full of, um, God, the testosterone that's kicking around in We Fought Them in Gunboats, you know, plus, plus, plus the, you know, the gin um, and the benzedrine and, and, you know, all of that, um, you know, it was very, very um, fierce stuff. But it goes in in all directions. So I'm going to skip along um but, but i just had to put in that picture of um the saint nazaire raid because we are coming up to the 80th anniversary yeah, yeah um, week. yes and that um was painted by a young man called david cobb who um became you know a, a, a very famous um marine artist after the war and before the war you know he was he was virtually still at school i mean he he just <clears throat> started at, at university um, but he became part of coastal forces and I do absolutely honour um, Peter Scott because in his book The Narrow Seas where he's telling all these stories of tremendous guts and bravery and dash and all of that he says please remember this is not a good thing war is not a good thing you can get glory in other ways you don't have to he, he's he's really worried about the glorification of of war and, and and I really like him um for that yeah. so once they got into these little boats uh, there, there was sort of so many uses for them and here's Dunstan Curtis who's very famous um at um for being in MGB 314 at Saint Nazaire but before that actually he'd been slipping across um to land agents and and um you know pick people up because suddenly there was all this um clandestine stuff and here's this you know soulful looking soulful looking um chap and he's called Francis Brooks Richards and he's one of my RNVS VSR blokes and he starts to run um you know flotillas across from the southwest across to the Brittany 
coast because um, either for agents um, or to support the resistance or later on to pick up um, escapees. Um, and here's David Howarth, another really, um, you know, aesthetic, historical BBC type. Um, and, and, and yet you find him um, an essential part of the Shetland bus. Um, and my lovely man, who, who, you know, you also admire, Patrick Dalzell Job. Um, I never say, know whether to say Job or Job. I, somebody one day is going to jump on me and say, for God's sake. We've had both pronunciations on this channel, and I don't know anyone's told us that we're right or wrong so i, I well, yeah. one day one day we'll, we'll have to find we'll have to find out um and, and then then we'll all because you know he, he's he you know he's definitely he's definitely a hero um of of this war um but one of the things and i'm going to um one of the reasons i think neville shoot is so remarkable was not only was he working there with um, Charles Goodeve in the Department of um, Miscellaneous Weapons, but he was writing his war novels. And I don't think people have spent enough time putting Neville Shute's novels into order and seeing how they um, marry up with what he was actually doing at the time. And they, they do show a really fascinating progression. But this one, um, which he wrote in 1943, um, was censored and he was terribly angry. Um, again, he just, he just, he was really, really cross. But it tells about a really horrible flamethrower. And, you know, in his day job, he was making horrible flamethrowers. But this just shows how horrible flamethrowers were. And I think maybe although he knew a lot, maybe he hadn't quite realised um, that what he was telling in here, which was about disguising um, fishing boats to slip across to Brittany, was exactly what these, these southwest yachtsmen were doing. Um, so although he was awfully cross, and, and although normally I'm not, not keen on censorship, I do actually think the Admiralty you know, at that point, you know. Um, they had a point, yeah, yeah. And, point. and I have to say, you've really got me thinking about putting Shoot's books in, in order because yeah. my mum is a is a great Neville Shoot fan, so I was introduced to his books. So I would have been, I would have been in my in 10, 11, 12 years old, and the Pied Piper is all about getting the, 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 the people out of France. And so I'm, I'm now thinking of the, it's it's got me thinking about going back and rediscovering his books. Um, oh, definitely, Paul, definitely. If you just, if you start with what happened to the Corbett's and, and, and which for 1938 and you work through, I mean, the Pied Piper is a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Anyway, um, we, we mustn't, we, we mustn't. We could, do a, we could do a literary uh, discussion about Neville Shute, but yeah, we'll, we'll, yep. we'll carry on well, going. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm on if you are. Yep. Because <laughs> I do actually think, um, that some of his books are novels with a war background, but I actually think that Most Secret is a really good war novel, and it's about war, and it's about the horribleness of war, as well as the bravery of war and the difficult decisions of war. And, uh, and I, don't think, um, I don't think people necessarily see what an outstanding book it is, but that, that's mm. just what I think. Um, yeah, yeah, and... and it's all right. We're on slide 13 um, and, and there are 14 um, because I've just looked at my watch and I can see that I have you, you've you've been. It's, it's <laughs> lovely. I'm enjoying it. Don't worry. It's fine. Well, here's here's another here's another hero. Um, this is Edward Young and you all have read one of our submarines, I think. Yeah. Um, and I think when I want to convince people of how extraordinary there were um, the, the the people stepping out from their normal lives. Um, I, I, I tend to use Edward Young because you know he was the production manager at um, Penguin, um, and and yet you know he was and and to start with um, the Navy weren't going to have amateurs on submarines. You, you weren't allowed to volunteer for submarines, um, but you know he he was persistent. He persevered, so he was the first amateur. Um, to enter the submarine service and eventually um, he was the first, there was a Canadian um, RNVR chap, um, Sherwood as well, um, and they, they, they did their perisher courses um, and um, but you know he's, it, but what I, what I really love was when he got his, his submarine, he got his beautiful um, uh, S-type um, HMS Storm um, he, he then started having a, a, a newspaper, an onboard newspaper so I thought well, this, that, that's lovely, so he hasn't forgotten where he comes from, you know really. Um, and he, before the war, he'd been sharing a flat with this guy, um, Rory McLean. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, Rory McLean. And they were typographers. And, and so, 
for some reason, I discovered quite a lot of sort of printers and typographers um, in my um, RMVSR types. Um, and he was another one with extremely bad eyesight. Um, and he said, oh, but I've got a cousin who's a lieutenant commander. And that was that helped because um, my dad didn't have a cousin who was a lieutenant commander. And I found it when I was looking at my father's box, you know, I found um, letters he'd written and sent to his captain saying, yeah, I know I've got very bad eyesight, but I could go on a submarine and I, you know, I'm very good at um, codes. I'm, you know, you could have, I could be a cipher clerk on, on a submarine. Um, and that was actually what McLean did to start with. Right. He was sent as a liaison um, officer on a French submarine. Then he was um, sent back with some of the other typographers to go and work um, in the inter-services topographical unit because they'd realized they did actually need to know a bit more about places like the coast of you know Norway or as it were Normandy um, and he felt very uncomfortable at being back in Oxford and not in uniform so he volunteered for these crazily brave um, people um, who you know as a, um, a D-Day man you'll, you'll know about them um, and, and you know Sicily and, and um, Salerno and, and they were the Combined operations pilotage parties, mm. and yep. there's, there's a wonderful moment of um, of coincidence, I suppose, when Edward Young is out in his submarine um, in, in um, Trincomalee, and he's asked to drop um, one of these um, uh, folding canoes. Um, and a, a reconnaissance party on the coast of Sumatra and it all goes hideously wrong and it's absolutely terrifying and he has to make these terribly difficult decisions do I submerge my submarine you know very very expensive bit of naval kit or do I wait for somebody who's rowing back in a dinghy under a hail of machine gun fire you know, terribly difficult um, and then about a week or two later, um, McLean turns up um, in Trincomalee and he, he says to Ed Young, he said, look, I'm, I'm really looking for somebody with a submarine you know, to help to drop me off the coast of Sumatra. <laughs> and Edward Young says, absolutely not bally likely, I'm not going there again. <laughs> and and um, Rory McLean says, you know, it, it, and they pass each other um, in because he, he finds somebody else in the submarine um, to take him and they pass. And he's, he, he, he just has a lovely line. He says, if I'd realised, um, you know, in, in the pre-war days, because they, they were sharing flat, um, that that um, my friend and I would pass each other in the night, um, you know, in the in the um, far east. I think we'd have rushed down to the Black Lion with shaking hands to have a pint. <laughs> Wow. And, the, and it's just it's just again ordinary people doing extraordinary things um not many of my yachtsmen got to sail um in the war but here's here's a, a, a chap adrian seligman um and he's you know you could do you could do a program um on on people like him um but here he is in the greek islands um with these disguised i, I think you call them kikes C A I Q U E, and one of your listeners might know how to say it. You know, I don't want to say kayak because it's not a kayak. It's a, yeah, it's a, I it's think a, it's kike. I don't know. It's kike. Yeah, let's yeah. let's yeah. let's say kike until somebody tells us yeah. differently. Um, so he, he he took over these these kikes, um, and and um, sort of ferried um, special forces troops from island to island, um, or took people off, or dropped agents on, or took you know radio supplies and you know that's that's not a bit of the war that i think one knows very much about and and again he'd had he was lucky he met he, he was posh been to harrow um and he met an, another old harrovian sitting in a bar in alexandra as you do and he said now you know at school you were good at art weren't you and and he said no i really need to be able to camouflage um my little boats you know when i'm lying up during the day and and they devised very similar to what um, Dazzle Job did in Norway. Um, they devised systems of sort of netting, but you had to make sure you had the right coloured netting for whatever the right, whichever island you were going to. Because of course, mm. you know, some of them were sort of you know yellowy grey, and some were sort of you know orangey browny. So if you put your wrong nets up, could sneak there in the night, um, and in the morning you could you could look a bit you could look a bit um, silly. But what I really um, wanted to get to, and, and and this is this is this is 
my last slide, although it's not the end of the war, was that something that struck me as um, I was sort of going through this, and I think it's very much what you were saying at the beginning, it was the amount of different skills and different learning that all had to come together. So there we were, we'd been chucked out, um, you know, we'd messed up, um, lots of attitudes had to be reconsidered. And and when it sort of got to the end, not not the end, but you know, I'm you, you're a D-Day specialist, so you know, um, it, it wasn't it wasn't the end, but it was you know definitely. Um, but generally, the the re-invasion of Europe, and and I I suppose having had Uncle Jack at Operation Jubilee, um, which will also come up to um, an anniversary this year, and seeing how badly things could go wrong um and you know the, the the amount of you know sort of mistaken thinking and hidebound attitudes um had gone on there you know it really was rather remarkable how the different sets of of landings they, they had to learn that the navy wasn't for fighting out it um at the high seas anymore the navy was for getting the army ashore so instead of being blue water you had to be sort of amphibious so so you weren't a sort of purist anymore you, you had to understand about small boats and landing craft and all of that so here you can't really see very well it's a hideous barrage of rocket launchers um developed by either neville norway or edward terrell or you know some of those clever people lots of whom well, you know, a significant number of whom were um, former yachtsmen in the Department of Miscellaneous Weapons Development, because um, they had learned at Dieppe that you jolly well had to pul do a bit of pulverizing before you could expect people to whiz ashore in their landing craft. Um, here, that this is a picture which which I I sent you beforehand because a friend of mine. Um, Gave, she took it out of her frame for me yesterday and 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 gave it and um here's her here's her father and her father and my father were great friends and here he is as an elderly man and I I you know like you think that old older people have always been old so I was assumed that Stuart had always been you know he'd always looked like that and I'd quite forgotten that that well because I hadn't known um that he looked like that um and that was when he was 20 um, and he was in charge of a tank landing craft um, running in towards Gold Beach. And, you know, according to Vicky, he had the nous to take this photograph. And I find that just sort of astonishing, you know, that, that you're age 20, you're in charge of this 30 great, you know, 180 foot steel sort of box full of tanks you're roaring in there the wind is blowing you sideways because because the, the, the weather conditions the beach is really full you can't see what well, he says in his mum he, he really couldn't see anywhere to go and yet you have the, the the savvy to bring out your box brownie or whatever it was and take a photo and i just think i just um and, no, it's and, amazing. I mean, I, I, obviously, we can't blow it up any bigger. But when you send to me, it's yeah. high resolution. I mean, it, it's definitely Gold Beach. And I think yeah. if I pop up, I might, I'm going out tomorrow with my friend Colin. We might even try and kind of work out where it is on Gold Beach. I think it's kind of, I think in the middle is Versailles, and it's over the cliffs towards Aaron Morse on the right. But I'll need to have a look yeah. at it again. He but, said he was, in his memoir, he says he's being blown sideways towards the Point de Verre. Right. Um, okay. I mean, it's, and, it's, it's one of those things, I, you know, I we assume there's no more photos to turn up of D-Day and then a photo turns up of D-Day never seen before. And it's going to, it's going to, it'll, it'll get me excited that one trying to work out I'm exactly so where it is and so where the, where the, which ships are in it and which section they're coming in. I think it's sort of, yeah, I think it's um, there, so Mary and Anel in the middle there, but uh, Colin is just saying we can do that tomorrow. So we're going to, we're going to go out and try and work out where it is. So um, and I can tell, I can tell my friend Vicky that it was worth her while you know, going down Making to the frame. The frame. And getting yeah, it no, definitely. And Great, that's one. That's wonderful. Um, and you know, we were saying earlier that, that it's it, it's hard to um, give women their proper place um, in wartime. I'm just going to go back for a last time to that. Uh, where are we? Here we are. So here he is, as very el elderly gentleman, and there's his wife as a very elderly. Uh, well, you know, to me they looked elderly. They're like, actually, mm. they're, they're not at all. Um, but 
she was one of the first um, aeronautical engineers. And of course, he didn't know at the time, but when he was sitting out there and he was seeing um, the, the, the aeroplanes come over, she was the first female um, engineer taken on by Hawker. So we'll just give her her due. Wow. And there's Patrick um, Dalzell Job. And I think if we put that photo next to the photo at the beginning, we'd see, as we must have seen for so many of these young men, how much they had grown and matured in that significant five yeah. years. Yeah. No, definitely. Well, I mean, it's been absolutely enthralling talking to you and listening to you. People loved it. There's not that many been questions coming in. They've just been sitting there spellbound, I think. But, you know, <laughs> I'll remind people again that the link to purchase Julia's book is in the description below. Uh, of course, you can buy it at any of your your chosen local bookshop or your online uh, seller. Is it out now? Is it pre-order yet? It's out very soon. It, isn't it, it comes out tomorrow. And what I'm really excited about is it's going to be an audio book because half my family won't read a book all oh, right yeah they, they will listen to an audio book so i'm suddenly my my family readership you know has, has, has is going to double um tomorrow so, so i'm, I'm yeah, pleased about that well i mean it's it it is what well, i said at the beginning i'm going to echo what i said earlier a lot of books about the navy are about the ships they're about the big capital vessels kind of engaging each other. Mm. this is a story about people it's people and the connection is they, they, you know, they all started in this, in this, the, signing this bit of paper, essentially, and <laughs> becoming part of the list. But what an, ex I mean, there's no corner of the globe that you don't seem to have been in this talk tonight. We've been on the, you know, chatting for just I don't know, over an hour and 15 minutes, but you've taken us to Norway, Saint Nazaire, uh, Dieppe, Beaches of Dunkirk, Operation Ariel, which is just up to me, part of it in Cherbourg in Normandy. I mean, there's, well, we've done, we've done um, Sumatra as well. I mean, I, I, we're pretty much, Cross the traverse the globe, which would be a brilliant way of describing what these young men did. Is they they traverse the globe to bring us that victory? Yeah, thank you, Paul. That that's a very a lovely way to put it. Brilliant. Well, we'll bring things to an end, folks. I mean, people just, people just I'll put up some of the things on an amazing presentation. Says Ian Carr, uh, Cliff, uh, that is an excellent presentation from wonderful lady. This has been outstanding from Willie there. Uh, this has been outstanding from Sparky. So everyone has loved it. So basically, we're going to say come yes. back at some point in the future and expand on perhaps one of the characters and take us all the way through. I don't know. But you're welcome back whenever, whenever you want, basically. And oh, God, I wish you, you incredible success with the book because um, it it's, it's just sounds it little. It's right up the people who are watching today's their street. It's good. So uh -huh. it ticks all the boxes. Heroism. <laughs> Uh, some, a story they won't know, but they'll be familiar with aspects of it. it. Takes them across the globe. What what more can you want? Thank you very much indeed. Thank oh, brilliant. You. Well, um, folks, I'm just going to remind you that I am on another person's uh, stream later on. In another 35 minutes, I'm joining um, Lance and my friends from Fighting on Film, the Outcasts Creative. We are discussing our favorite historical movies. So check me out on Twitter and Facebook, and you can get the link to that or just search uh for on, on youtube so i'm joining another someone else's show in half an hour's time tomorrow we bring we continue our look at the navy we've got nick stanley talking about the uh mind sweeping operations off mamansk and archangel that'll be fantastic on friday an extra shop show julio from italy is coming on to talk about the battle of cert or the two battles of cert one in december 41 and one in march 42 and that will bring naval battles week to an end so if you're new to the channel don't forget to click like don't forget to uh, subscribe to the channel. Consider becoming a patron. Consider become, becoming a YouTube member and get out there and order your copy of Julia's book right now. Don't Just don't argue with me. Just go out and do it. So we'll get that done. So, Julia, thank you very much for joining me. And um, and I'll have you take me out on your, your yacht one day because I, 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 I'm, I'm, from, I'm from Essex. So the Thames Estuary is a bit south for me, but I, I grew up in all the, you know, uh, Within Ho and Mersey and, oh, and all those kind of places, so that's that's a coast I know. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, yeah. well, yeah, you're uh, on we'll set a date then. I'll 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 get my I'll get my sea legs ready and the life jacket, and I'll come over and you can take me out yachting. Brilliant. <laughs> l luckily, I'm a, I'm a very I'm a very unadventurous sailor. You'll uh, be look, safe. I, I, I wouldn't want it all. I wouldn't. I want it all nice and calm and just. I'd I'd, yeah. go, I'd go for the I'd go for the sailing, but I'd stay for the beer. Basically, is what. <laughs> Let, let's do that. Good. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. okay, then. Well, cheers, everybody. This is Paul Wadad from World War II TV saying I will see you all again. Thank you for joining us today. Cheers, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye.